Uh, thank you very much, technician. Uh, maybe a few words about uh, this meeting and the technicalities behind it. It's wonderful um, to have us all gathered here on, at this online workshop that will focus on understanding more about the EU-funded LIFE program. Understanding of it may lead us to opportunities to create synergies with our mission to implement the Laudato Si Encyclical, the letter you are most likely aware of in which Pope Francis invite, invited us to collaborate. In the course of the next 90 minutes, we will be introduced to how the LIFE program fits into the initiatives that the EU has put in place to tackle climate change and offered characteristics of this funding mechanism. Well, due to his uh, illness, we unfortunately will miss Angelo Salsi, head of unit D2. Um, yet we will have the pleasure to first hear from Mr. Christian Strasser. He is the head of unit D1, Life, Energy and Life Climate, who will speak about the LIFE program from this year, 2021 to 2027. He will present it in detail and show how the program is now geared to achieve the goals of the Green Deal. We will then hear from Claudia Guerini, project manager in the unit D11, also on life climate. She will present us a few of the projects that are ongoing or recently concluded that should resonate with our activities from around Europe and beyond. My name is uh, Peter Rajic. I'm a Slovenian born Jesuit working here in Brussels at JESC together with the European Laudato Sea Alliance. And I would also like to give you some technical instructions for our meeting today. Please be aware that this workshop is recorded now and that recorded recording will be published on our media channel. If you don't wish to be recognized, you can rename your screen name using um, just your first name. I would invite you to keep your camera on to enhance the sense of community. I think it would be wonderful to see our faces to the extent uh, possible, uh, but feel free to switch it off if you need to take a pause. We also would like to invite you to introduce yourself in the chat. To help keep background noise to a minimum, make sure you mute your microphone when you're not speaking. And I will try to do the same. You will hear sometimes background noise coming from the uh, works uh, outside. So we'll try to be disciplined. As you know, this meeting is being interpreted and you can find the interpretation channels at the bottom of the screen. And if you encounter any issues, please use the chat function and our team will help you out. I would suggest that we keep questions until the Q&A part, the Q&A session, and focus first and entirely on the presentations. So I hope that works for all. So welcome again. Let me now introduce the speakers of today. First, we'll go Mr. Christian Strasser. As I said, he's the head of Unit D1, Life Energy and Life Climate, and he holds the position from April 1st of this year as the head of unit. Uh, this is in Senia, the Climate Infrastructure and Environment Executive Agency based here in Brussels. The unit is in charge of implementing two sub-programs in the LIFE program, namely climate change migration and adaptation and clean energy transition. Prior to his current appointment, he has been head of unit of the finance unit in EASME, supporting the implementation of different EO programs such as Horizon 2020, COSME Life and EMFF. Before joining the European Commission in 1998, Mr. Strasser worked as auditor in the Austrian tax authorities. Christian Strasser is a graduate of the Linz International Business School. So Mr. Strasser, the floor is your and yours and thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. A pleasure to be, to be with you, you uh, with you here. Um, we have the first slide, I guess, for the presentation. I can start already now. Uh, welcome again to this live webinar. It's a pleasure to be with you to present you this fascinating program, live program, the EU flagship funding instrument for the environment and climate change, the climate action. 
Ich sehe auch viele Gäste aus dem deutschsprachigen Raum und möchte Sie daher auch auf Deutsch begrüßen. Herzlich willkommen. Sie haben hier einen EU-Beamten aus Österreich vor Ihnen, genauer gesagt aus Linz. Und ich arbeite seit ungefähr 25 Jahren hier bei der Europäischen Kommission. I change back to English. It was foreseen that the presentation, as Peter already said, uh, is given by three colleagues, but unfortunately, our head of department, Mr. Angelo Salzi, fell sick and is caught in Italy, however, not caught by COVID, luckily. Therefore, we are two today, and again, I present myself, Christian Strasser, head of Unit D1, Life Energy and Life Climate. Uh, and I have with me, I'm accompanied by an experienced project manager in my unit, uh, by Claudia Guerini. Uh, I was recently appointed to this function on the 1st of April. However, I worked already previously some years ago in DG Environment in the European Thank Commission as a, as, a, as a manager of the LIFE program. Let's see here some noise. Maybe we can get rid of that. Uh, I, I continue. Where do we work here in Brussels? Uh, obviously, we work in Brussels because we have a LIFE fund, a LIFE program, which is managed centrally in Brussels. Uh, and um, we are an executive agency which is called CINEA. And CINEA, I just want briefly to explain to you, CINEA, what is that? CINEA is the European Climate Infrastructure and Environment Executive Agency. We also call ourselves the Green Deal Agency because the programs here in this agency are more or less quite more than less, by far more than less and orientated to the implementation of the Green Deal. The Green Deal is in fact the priority of the European Commission President, the current European Commission President. We manage here, you can see that several programs in CINEA with a huge budget of 55 billion euros in, uh, in, in the seven years, in the, in, the, in, the, in the financing period 21 to 27, uh, contributing to the decarbonization and sustainable growth. You see here the life in the yellow field, the life program, but we have also in fact the CEF2 on the right uh, corner. You see connecting Europe facility two, it's transport and energy orientated uh, to create infrastructure and sustainable interconnected trans-European networks. We have then renewable energy financing mechanism. Uh, and here in fact, it's about renewable energy and increasing investment in production capaci capacity. Just transition mechanism is a public sector loan facility. Also here, just transition, as it said, also to help the most affected regions uh, for, the, for the energy transition and for the, for the climate change uh, neutrality to become climate neutral, in fact, in Europe, and uh, with the aim of, no, of to nobody left behind. And we have also the famous, I would say, Horizon program, Horizon Europe, also with the cluster five dedicated to climate, energy, and mobility. The Innovation Fund is an element in our agency, which is also managed there, contributing to greenhouse gas reduction and financed from the EU emission trading system. And then at the end, we have also the European Maritime Fisheries and Aquaculture Fund, MFAF called, or the abbreviated. Uh, it's a promotion of sustainable blue economy and in fact, to sustain, sustainably manage seas and oceans and also international ocean governance. These are the programs of the agency. So life is embedded in this agency. And again, I want to reiterate the world Green Deal because in fact, it's really an agency which is to a very large extent orientated to help and to implement the, the Green Deal. The next slide, please. We see here Pope Francis, uh, who was saying to an extraordinary moment of prayer on the 27th of March, 2020, uh, we carried on regardless thinking we would stay healthy in a world that was sick. So this was a very much clear message. We must act now. This was the message one year ago. And re when reading the sentence during the presentation of this webinar today, one thought came into, into my mind. And in fact, it's related to the genesis, to the story of Noah and Noah's Ark, in fact, which for Christian religion is an element of thinking of the human race because the human race was showing itself not being dignified enough to care for the world given to them. And one can get the impression that we listen to climate change, we lead, listen to development, that also for the moment, we are also at a very a critical doorstep, in fact, how to go on with our future and how to go on with our planet. 
And I go back now to the live program and uh, to the next slide. The live program as such, uh, some elements here. It's a people's program. So since uh, the, the program exists since very long, you see here since 92, we are celebrating next year 30 years of life. And we have funded under this program around 5,500 projects so far. And this was also, or there was creating a proud and committed community in Europe. So live program, live, live program funded projects also in my country in Austria, you see very often, in fact, in nature areas where you see, uh, uh, where you see um, uh, uh, post signs, in fact, where a project and the area has been supported by the live program that you can see very often when you see the the, the, the flag, which uh, you see afterwards with, with Claudia as well. So very often you find that really in the real life as well. So the 5,500 projects have, have their trace in our countries. So the program as such is engaging stakeholders, improving governance uh, structures, uh, building capacity among Europe's beneficiaries, partners, reaching out to tens of millions of Europeans. Yeah caring also for volunteering because we are also participating with the live program in the European Solidarity Corps, where young people can participate, mobilizing finance, networking and sharing experience and bottom-up approach. As I said, 30 years ago in 92, the program was created. And it, in fact, it started as a nature program. So maybe some of you might remember that the life program is something which is very much linked to nature uh, and biodiversity, nature. So, and indeed it was starting in 92 as that because it was in fact the habitat directive which was approved uh, in, in, in 92 by in the European Union. And at that time when the EU was expanding the competence in fact on the, on the, in the field of habitat conservation, there, a program, a funding program uh, had to be set up, in fact, to help to implement this directive. Yeah? And the first one, the initial intentions were that actions for bird species and sites could continue to receive support in the moment. And in the context of, of the birds directive and some additional other funds were made available for the conservation of other endangered, endangered species and habitats. So that was in fact the origin, a nature oriented uh, program. And the life program was then in the coming years enlarged by environmental aspects before, like water, waste, uh, air, policy areas and others. Uh, since 2014, we have a new strand, which is the climate action sub program. This was added in 2014. And now in the programming period now, 21 to 27, is the current programming period, there was a fourth uh, strand and sub-program added to this program, which is called Clean Energy Transition. I will come to the strands later, um, later after Claudia's uh, project presentation. Now, um, the new life program, on the next side, slide we see the new life program uh, is as, as a whole constitutes a 100% contribution to the objectives and targets of the European Green Deal. It's, and that's very important as well, the only program dedicated exclusively and really to, to underline here exclusively to the environment, major conservation and climate action. The budget is 5.4 billion euros for the seven years now which is a significant increase compared to the previous programming period by 60%. So indeed the member states attributed to this, life, to this program. Uh, and I would say given the success it has shown in the previous years, an increase of 60% of, of budget. So now we are handling or managing 5.4 million in the seven years. That means a little bit less than 800, something like 800 million euros per year uh, distributed among all strands. Um, and we have a move on work program, which is just adopted, will be adopted, in fact, this Friday. And uh, we come maybe later, later to the point that also that core 21, the main call for proposal 21, will be published next week. That you can all see on the websites and, uh, and, and, and you will find it there. Um, as I said, the program is 100% contributing to the European Green Deal and the exclusivity. Uh, that the program is dedicated to the environment, the nature, biodiversity, climate action, and clean energy transition. All together, also, of course, to reach the climate goals in 2030 and 2050. Uh, 
Also, I want to make a reference here, giving the auditorium, giving you, in fact, here today with us, in fact, to make a reference to the Christian religion and the expression in the Bible of a thorn in the flesh and stachel in flesh. Uh, and Christians of being sometimes a, a thorn in the flesh when something or somebody needs our help, yeah? Being it, poverty, being it people in poverty, but also being it our nature, our planet, our environment, or our climate who have no advocate, who have no support as such, being a common good, you know, all that, uh, which risks to be or is already depleted or exhausted quite, quite to a large extent. And Christians have the aspiration to help the closest. So here also the LIFE program, if I can make this, let's say, a link to, uh, to the program again, uh, the LIFE program is something which was always in the 30 years exclusively dedicated to environment and nature. And in that role, of course, uh, the program was not always in line with uh, other policies uh, and, uh, and was sometimes even in contradiction to objectives of other policy areas, which, was, which lies in the nature of the program. But again, the main point here is that the LIFE program is the exclusive, let's say, uh, orientation uh, on, 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 on nature, environment, and climate action. Um, last slide now, before Claudia comes to the floor, is who can apply in LIFE? Um, a, an overview here that we have all a public or private legal entity which must be registered in the EU, uh, a third country associated to the LIFE program, or any uh, entity created by union law or any international organization. So in the last line, in fact, is the most important one. Um, natural persons, so individuals are not, uh, let's say, are not eligible to apply under the LIFE program. So in fact, uh, close to everybody can apply if they have a legal status, yeah? but natural persons, individuals cannot apply. If there are reasons for, if there are questions on that, we can reply them, uh, of course, later on. Now, I would give the floor to Claudia to give you some examples of what we funded uh, over the past years. And um, Claudia, please, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you very much, Christian. Uh, very welcome from my side. I'm very honored to be here with you today. And um, I, will, um, I will give you some examples to show you how life program has been uh, uh, thinking about uh, leaving nobody behind well before the just transition mechanism. Since uh, the, the very beginning, um, LIFE program has been also uh, a program uh, with a specific attention to social aspects. And I will now uh, try to, to share my screen once again, hopefully without uh, the, the nasty, unpleasant uh, band on the top. Let's see, hopefully. Okay. Uh, seems so that it doesn't work. Uh, okay. I hope that there will be no uh, problem. Okay. Um, this is uh, the first project I want to talk to you about. It's a Greek project named Stematos. It's a very recent project uh, financed uh, uh, with the call uh, 2019 and uh, started just last year and will last uh, till uh, 2025. It's located uh, in Greece, Mount Athos, and in France, La Vallée de Solon. And these are two um, Natura 2000 uh, areas. And um, interesting that uh, among the partners, we have the Holy Community of Mount Athos and the Monastère de Solon, uh, Les Amis de Solon. Um, well, um, the, the objectives um, of this project are mainly to reduce vulnerability to climate change uh, related uh, disturbances with a, with a specific focus on wildfires. The increase, uh, increase ecosystem resilience to climate change related stresses uh, such as droughts, but also diseases, for instance, and disseminate project results and best practices at local level to the Montatos monastic community and local stakeholders, 
and within other monastic communities and sectors from other European uh, uh, countries. And the management of the natural environment in Mount Athos uh, is particularly interesting for its specific conditions of both nature and culture. It is an almost fully forested mountain with high biodiversity and very high historical and cultural value. And the project also planned to set up the first climate change observatory in addition to management of forests that are still partly unmanaged and water because water resources are very limited as you can uh, as you can imagine the next uh, example uh, i want to talk you about is the project solid food waste it is located in france is a project that will last uh, till the next year with the european contribution uh, of more than 2 uh, million euros and uh, uh, it's related to uh, let's say poverty uh, and they have specific target groups like people with disabilities professionals and general public well uh, we have to say that uh, unfortunately uh, we have 20% uh, of wasted food production in the european union and in france one person out of 10 suffers from hunger and always in france almost half a million disabled people are affected by unemployment we must act definitely and solid uh, food waste aims to develop a national food waste reduction chain by upgrading bread, fruits, and vegetables, and at the same time, creating jobs for people with major disabilities. Objectives are to protect the environment and fight food waste, to create and maintain, this is very important, maintain jobs for people with disabilities, and to raise awareness uh, related, this is related to the general, uh, um, to the general public. Of course, this has an important, also an important social impact. They have decided the reallocation of 5% of production to food aid NGOs and the redistribution of 1% of profits to NGOs in the field of disability and environment. The third project I want to talk to you about is a project that I have the, the chance to, to manage as project manager from, uh, from the agency, so I know it quite well. It's an Austrian uh, project, Double Plus, uh, recently closed uh, in the area, in the region of Tyrol. And they had uh, um, four important uh, uh, target groups, migrants, single households, elderly women with less pension, long-term long -term unemployed people. This is dealing with uh, energy efficiency in buildings, but is strongly, strongly related to energy poverty. And these uh, um, projects uh, creates added value for all. What is good for people is also good for the climate. So it's a good example of a win-win uh, solution. I will come back to this uh, in, in a few moments. The project um, enables people with low incomes uh, to make their own contribution to the energy and climate strategy of Tyrol and at the same time improving their financial situation and quality of life they will at the same time reduce emissions but they will also reduce their energy consumption and costs of course it is foreseen uh, a system of 
individual coaching. And through this coaching, people with low income, uh, living in low income households, receive useful advices on how to protect the climate, as well as an energy efficiency and climate protection starter package. I've had the opportunity to visit uh, uh, one of these uh, households uh, when I visited the project and I was part uh, of, the, of the team uh, who uh, coached um, this, uh, this family. In that case was uh, a single, uh, an elderly uh, woman with, uh, with less pension. And uh, in addition, they also um, receive uh, um, adapted measures such as, for instance, uh, the train the trainer program, uh, very important for the volunteers who uh, acted as uh, coaches and um, informal campaigns and the teaching of climate protection basics in German language course, courses for beginners. They offer uh, multipliable measures for climate protection and for increasing the energy efficiency in the areas of housing, eating, electricity, mobility, procurement, and nutrition. As I told you a few moments ago, um, this is a good example of win-win solution for all. It's a, a win solution for households because uh, individual actions aiming to protect the climate uh, result in a reduction of energy expenditure and increased quality of life. It's a win solution for volunteers, coaches, because the valuable training for energy and climate coaches and the meaningful activity with also a very important social added value result in further possibilities for, for their future, meaning a new contacts and extended networks and also personal development. And last but not least, there is, it is a, um, a winning solution for Tyrol province as well, because promoting the protection of climate and reducing energy consumption and carbon emissions by acting more consciously with more responsibility means that the common vision they have of energy autonomous Tyrol comes closer. Uh, I would like, um, as last information, I would like to mention the fact that uh, Caritas Tyrol was part of this uh, consortium. I don't know if somebody from Car Caritas Tyrol uh, is attending this webinar, but in case uh, I would like to, to mention it. The last example uh, I want to uh, talk about is, uh, is not a life project, honest. It's a project, Empowerment, that has been co-financed by uh, Horizon 2020 Energy Efficiency. And there are two main reasons uh, I want to talk about it. One uh, is that uh, it's related uh, to um, energy poverty, and you will see uh, it has uh, some similarities uh, with Life Double Plus. Second reason is that uh, uh, it has been co-financed by a program that from this year is the fourth part of Life program, but Christian will uh, discuss uh, more deeply uh, later on. Empowerment is, um, is a project that will last until uh, 2023 and is located in uh, several uh, member states. And not only, you can see that there is also Albania. And the reason is that uh, under age 2020, eligibility, eligible countries are many more than for life uh, um, program. And um, they have um, an interesting target group uh, and they have over 4,000 households affected by energy poverty in coastal areas of Mediterranean countries with a specific focus on women, women-led households and households with health 
issues. They have specific objectives. They want to raise public awareness on energy poverty and the means for its alleviation, focusing on the specifics of coastal areas, gender and health aspects. They implement practical solutions tailored to um, empower households affected by energy poverty and they formulate local, national, and uh, European policy recommendations and promote solutions to tackle energy poverty. Uh, concretely, what they do? Uh, well, uh, among the actions, uh, there are energy visits to households, installation of saving devices, and promotions of energy measures. They have energy advice uh, training to build the capacity of actors and partners, a collect collective assemblies on energy and health, a do it together energy workshop and advocacy campaign. As I told you at the beginning, uh, you can easily uh, identify uh, similarities uh, with uh, DAPE Plus. And uh, just to finish my, uh, my presentation, I would just to recall how LIFE program since the beginning has been a program uh, very attentive and very um, careful with social aspects. And we, we have considered to leave nobody left behind since uh, the, the very beginning. And this is our intention also in the future. And with the new program, it will be even more uh, possible. Uh, this is all from my side. And uh, I think that now um, Christian will give you some more uh, in deep information about the, uh, the next uh, program. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Claudia, for these uh, four examples, uh, which I hope give you a sort of, let's say, insight and a feeling of what is financed. Uh, as I said before already, life is a people's program. So it is not an exclusively social program, of course, it's a nature, environment, climate program, but has also aspects, other aspects uh, on board. Um, I go ahead now with uh, giving you an overview about the four uh, sub programs, so the life program, the current life program has four sub programs, and you see on this slides just in the middle column the four sub programs. The first one is, is uh, in fact the nature and biodiversity, so the origin of life. The second one is the circular economy and quality of life. Yeah? Uh, that's the second uh, uh, sub program. The third one is climate climate action, climate action and mitigation and adaptation measures. And the fourth is clean energy transition. And I will give, give you a short uh, a picture about the four different, in fact, uh, sub programs. And we start with nature and biodiversity. Nature and biodiversity, in fact, uh, that's the next slide, is aiming at halting and reversing biodiversity loss and the, degrad the degradation of ecosystems, including the marine and coastal uh, ecosystems. So you see on the right column, in fact, a relevant, so a link to Nat Natura 2000 networks. So it's in fact really supporting conservation and restoration um, aspects in Natura 2000 network, species protections, invasive alien species, ecosystem restoration, and much more. Also integrated implementation of, for instance, the biodiversity, the European biodiversity strategy. So that's an element here. Uh, regarding this um, biodiversity goals, also to mention here that there's a, a lot of effort in mainstreaming over all EU programs, not on the under life. And in 24, 26, and 27, there's a target of 10% of all EU funding must spend in this policy domain of, of, of biodiversity, of biodiversity restoration and biodiversity, in fact, um, uh, support. So there's a, there's a, that, that is in the biodiversity area, but also in the climate area, we have a similar mainstreaming all over, all, all over the programs, EU funds uh, available. The next uh, one is, next sub-program is circular economy and quality of life. 
here you that's the next slide here you can see on the, in the gray box uh, where it is uh, oriented to circular economy noise air chemicals also soil waste water so various areas various environmental areas in fact uh, which uh, we have on our plate where activities are needed yeah and you see uh, on the right hand side uh, the first one is supported public authorities for the implementation of the eu legislation on environmental issues uh, the second one is supporting technologies and solutions innovations in fact to bring them closer to the market yeah uh, so that's the second one and the third one is integrated projects uh, also here to promote upscale and access to finance so these are the circular economy and quality of life uh, sub-program activities. The third one is related, and the next one is related to climate, climate action, climate mitigation, and climate adaptation. In that sense, uh, there is a preamble in the life regulation which says that the union, uh, given the union's commitment to the Paris Agreement on climate change and to the UN sustainability, sustainability goals, we need a coordinated and efficient effort at European level. And therefore, uh, as I said before, for biodiversity, there's a mainstream target also for climate. There is an indicator in favor of climate change policies, which have to mainstream in EU funding. 30% of all EU budget has to support climate objectives. Just to show here as well that not only in the life program, but also in all other spending programs, in fact, 30% of all budget has to go to, sub to, to support climate objectives. In the life program, of course, 100% of the funds under this substrate goes to climate objectives, very clear. And we have the two, let's say, big areas, climate mitigation, where we aim, in fact, to implement the 2030 energy and climate policy. We also support the EU member states, the national plans, in fact, regarding national energy and climate plans, and also the mid-century unions plan, the meaning the targets for 2050. Yeah? On climate adaptation, in fact, there we are supporting the EU adaptation strategy, uh, and that's the, the, the main goal of the projects for funded under this, under this area. And you see also on the left hand side still also related governance, governance aspects as well as are supported in a very in a, in a specific strand of the climate sub program. The fourth sub program now is in fact the clean energy transition. That's the most recent one which has been added. There were this clean energy transition uh, predecessor programs. This was very long ago, and some of you might still know that it was the Intelligent Energy Europe program. This was running until 2013 for some 10 years. Uh, and in 2014, 2020, this uh, part of the program was under Horizon 2020 as market uptake. And this part of the Horizon 2020 program has joined the live program now in 21. So that is now in, uh, in live. We have here five areas of intervention. And you will see also in the publication of the call next week, this of course, these five intervention areas, but also a document which will give you some 20 priority topics under this clean energy transition sub program, explaining in fact, what is wished from the parent DG, from the policy DG, which is in fact here DG Energy in the European Commission, which areas should be addressed and where um, applicants should apply. So this is quite a top-down approach, which is not the normal one on the life. As I said before, the normal approach on the life is a bottom-up approach, really that it comes from the, from the population, from the people, uh, in fact, to invent and to, to, to develop the project, in fact, which, makes, uh, which has an impact and has an objective, of course, in terms of nature, environment, or climate. So here we have a rather top-down approach. So you see the intervention areas already here. And I just want to refer to one intervention area, which is the yellow box here, is engaging and empowering consumers. And here there is indeed as well a sort of social policy included, uh, in particular, which is called, in fact, uh, avoid energy poverty. Yeah? To help people in a structured way in poverty to reduce the energy bill, yeah? which was also quoted in the project just we heard before. So this part of, of this clean energy transition is also a very social policy element, which as well is included in the Green Deal. The Green Deal also speaks about energy poverty and to avoid and to mitigate energy poverty. poverty. So 
Um, to add here, uh, also again, it's a more structural approach under this clean energy sub program, uh, clean energy transition sub program. Uh, it is not to support excellence or innovation here in this sub program. This is done under Horizon Europe, but it is in fact to 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 allow, in fact, the uptake and, and, and the, the, the dissemination in a structured way over Europe uh, in a, a renewable energy and energy efficiency uh, targets, uh, which all together, of course, have an impact, have a significant impact on climate change mitigation. The next slide shows you a, the EU funding landscape to support energy efficiency. The title is energy efficiency, but it's a very good slide also. I hope you can see everything on this slide to give a sort of landscape as well, what, what are the funds available and where in fact life is, 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 is also placed there. You see on the left hand side direct investments. We have the famous now recovery and resilient facility, uh, which is, uh, let's say, discuss, was discussed recently. We have the funds, the cohesion funds, we have the social fund there. We have new, the just transition mechanism. These are all funds which are, let's say, managed at the national level. We have the second layer, leverage private investments. Invest EU is here the, 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 the header of it, in fact, the to sustainable infrastructure. Uh, we have then research and innovation, which is the Horizon Europe program with the various clusters and various grants. We have then addressed market barriers uh, here for clean and energy efficiency, uh, the LIFE program here, LIFE uh, circular economy, but LIFE clean energy transition climate. And at the end, we have in fact technical system advisory on the ELENA facility and others. Um, again, here, uh, if you see here the picture of five different funding sources, in fact, I, I want to again, um, let's say, uh, refer to the exclusiveness of the LIFE program being 100% dedicated to the Green Deal. Uh, and um, uh, other programs, of course, very often consider nature or environmental aspects, but they have sometimes conflicting uh, objectives. Yeah? Life cares sometimes even for mitigating measures uh, in, or in which happened, or which were needed, in fact, uh, in, term, in terms of other policy areas. And I think as an example on agriculture policy and related subsidies, which are not always fully considering environment and nature or biodiversity aspects. Think for instance on groundwater quality in some member states and related nitrate pollution. So there are various areas sometimes where in fact the LIFE program has a different objective uh, than uh, other, other funding instruments. And that's uh, again to repeat here that the LIFE program is the only program which is exclusively uh, addressed and uh, orientated to, 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 to the sub programs title, which I mentioned before. On the next slide, we see uh, an overview about the, the, the channels, which you can in fact uh, address and you can uh, look at them as you have got in fact the, the presentation, you, you will see them, you will have them in fact, please don't hesitate to go through them to, to, to get also in touch with us, you know, if you have any questions. As I, as I said before, tomorrow there will be, not tomorrow, sorry, next week there will be the publication of the main call for proposal under live under 421. And um, a last word I want to say here on the link to Laudato to see because somewhere we are embedded in Laudato to see here. And I think also the live program has basically a very important ethical and moral aspect. And Laudato Si can be an important point of reference. Both sides are somehow interconnected, defending and advocating for the poorest, being it the people or being it the environment is a common baseline. And I saw some examples when, when reading the Laudato Si, in fact, uh, you see in, one, in item 190, Pope Francis made uh, say that environmental protection cannot be assured solely by Technology, technology by market forces, by comparing costs and benefits. We need also to put resources, in fact, to this protection, to need to think and consider the real value of things for our citizens, for our culture, but all, and also for the needs of the poor. In another area, he said, in fact, uh, this, uh, let's say, um, uh, sort of, let's say, um, a criticism to, te te uh, to technology, this is not in contradiction with technology development, but they should not be seen alone. We have to see those as a part of, of the solution. And this is exactly what we're doing in life as well. We have here the, 
no harm principle. We always say uh, any project must be sustainable and must have an environmental, of course, positive impact. So in fact, this is a must in our award criteria that we have an impact, we have an environmental impact in our projects. And again, the no harm principle is also applied under, under life. So this does not in fact uh, contradict each other, uh, but under the life program, we, we really look at, at these aspects. And the Laudato Si in the fifth chapter, in the fifth chapter, in fact, it, it refers to the global governance, yeah, where also the, the focus is very much on civil society, uh, who plays an important role to, cre to create and maintain a certain pressure on policy and business with the aim to get a better world as we have it today. So life is a people's program, as I said before, we are very much funding, in fact, uh, or supporting civil society initiatives in many different forms and areas. So uh, I stop here. We certainly have the opportunity to further discuss uh, all of your questions uh, and I give now the back the word, I give, I give back the word and floor to Peter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian Strasser and uh, Claudia Guerini. This has been um, is a very important presentation for us. And as you mentioned at the end, there is an intrinsic link sometimes with, between Laudato Si and the LIFE uh, program because of values and much more. We see that there are resources available, there are people available, and the two of you have a number of years of experience working in the European Commission and the institutions, uh, most especially now uh, through the LIFE program. So thank you very much for this presentation. I think for us it's now very important that we are able to digest this presentation and much of the great input we have received and part of that will go through questions. So I will suggest, as Chinzi already mentioned in the chat, that you use the raise hand function in the uh, Zoom platform and then um, when you are given the word, please just introduce yourself, your name, the institution you're from, and then a specific question you might have in a short possible way. We are about 70 people gathered now, which is wonderful from different institutions related to the church, dioceses, uh, social centers, uh, caritas, justice and peace. We can go on and on. And I think uh, one of the questions that emerges uh, right now, uh, and I will begin with that if I may, is how can life support my Laudato Si inspired activity? For example, is uh, questions that we received as Elsia um, were formed like this, is life for my institution? If not, how can I benefit or how can we benefit from other experiences uh, implemented so far? You have shown four uh, different uh, examples, concrete cases. Um, the question was, can I apply on a loan as an organization or what type of partnership should I form? So maybe we begin with these two questions and then I will open the floor to uh, others. So uh, Claudia or Christian, uh, back to you. No, oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I start and Claudia, please compliment. Uh, yeah, indeed. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. The question is, how can li how is life coming to me? It's the, one of, the other way around, how I'm going to life. <laughs> Meaning, uh, you need to look which kind of projects and which, which objectives, in fact, are needed under this life program and to develop, in fact, uh, to develop a, a project out of that. Developing a project means I have to go from A to Z, meaning I want to do from A to Z the following activities with objectives, of course, what I want to obtain. Uh, this is very theoretical, what I'm saying now, of course, yeah. But one element is, for instance, you could look at the database under life, yeah. Just uh, look at the most recent selected projects of the year 2020 to get the feeling of what is done there. Uh, because it's quite broad, it goes from nature, it goes through the four sub-programs, as I mentioned before. Uh, so, uh, in fact, it depends really on, on in which area you want to do something, in which area you are, or your organization, in fact, is there uh, to, to develop an activity, which can, in fact, bring an added value in terms of what is expected under the life program. Uh, I know this sounds a bit theoretical, but in fact, I think you, you would get a flavor if, uh, if, 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 if the project database is screened. Secondly, as well, of course, uh, you might already have among your institutions, uh, organizations who are already partners in LIFE program, also benefit from this element. In fact, what they are doing in, in the LIFE program, what could be, and Claudia referred to one case already where Caritas Innsbruck, I think, was, was mentioned, uh, where which kind of activities, in fact, are, 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 are accepted as funding projects. 
and and and, and learn from them from there as well. Claudia, anything you want to add? I, I was muted. <laughs> okay. Um, well, um, um, I gave you already several um, examples uh, where uh, organizations uh, working um, in the uh, Catholic area maybe can uh, can be part of uh, of a consortium. Of course, uh, I can understand that uh, it can be quite uh, difficult for people who are starting now uh, to look at life program, to think about a proposal, so some doubts, how can I uh, organize a project? Can I do it? Uh, as uh, um, Christian mentioned also at the beginning, uh, uh, Life is a people program and is a bottom-up program, meaning that uh, it's up to the applicant uh, to build up uh, a proposal in terms of uh, actions, but also in terms of uh, consortium. So uh, a single uh, um, organization can submit a proposal and you can do it also in your mother tongue. This is another advantage of life program. Of course, in such a case, uh, we ask uh, a summary in English, but uh, you can submit the proposal in your language. That sometimes it's uh, much easier, even though the contract will be then managed in English. And uh, almost all uh, uh, legal entity can uh, can apply, not natural person. Uh, but there are several uh, opportunities. You can decide uh, to submit uh, a proposal if you have uh, an idea, but you can also uh, try to um, join a consortium that is building up a proposal. There are specific tools uh, to search for partners to build up a consortium. Um, or in addition, if you do not feel comfortable in writing or being part directly of a consortium, another opportunity you have just to, to get more um, knowledge about so what life uh, is financing, you can have a look at the database. You can find the link uh, in the last slide uh, we presented, and you can uh, um, check by keywords what you are interested in. And you can find, for instance, the, the, the projects uh, in uh, Innsbruck, in Tirol, Lapa Plus. You have the, the contact uh, reference of the coordinator and you can contact them to, to know how they did it. If you can uh, sometimes also uh, replicate, uh, if you are interested in replicate, replicating uh, results, uh, of, uh, of a previous, uh, of, of a project already ongoing or, uh, uh, or um, uh, already finished. And uh, in terms of, uh, of budget, uh, for instance, uh, it's quite uh, wide. Have you seen uh, in the project that I mentioned, uh, there are projects that they got uh, more than two million and a half as a U EU contribution, meaning that is around 55%. It means that the total budget uh, was uh, uh, around five million, but uh, the project in Innsbruck, for instance, got uh, a, lower, uh, a lower budget, but just because uh, it was still at the same percentage, uh, but just because the total budget was, uh, was lower. It depends on the, on, on the action on the, you, you plan, and as an average, uh, correct me, uh, Christian, if I'm wrong, but I think we are, as an average, around uh, one million, one million and a half, two million. Then uh, there are um, less, let's say, <laughs> expensive projects or more expensive. But uh, uh, this is uh, this is the average. And for the length, uh, usually there was no uh, specific limitation, but. Uh, if I will remember in the new uh, in the new program, maybe uh, we will have uh, a limit uh, to up to uh, 10, uh, 10 years. 
Maybe on the same question, if we may continue, uh, and I will gather a few questions uh, together now. There was a, a few came in in terms of, so who can, who can really apply? Uh, so again, uh, can, can someone propose a national project with only one partner or also a loan? That was one. And then uh, maybe I could add another question. Can, let's say, an NGO partner with a private company? Are private companies uh, eligible? And then maybe uh, a little bit connected still with that because not all of our organizations are big. So we may look at the minimum. And the question was, is there a minimum amount of co-financing this burst? Or what should you suggest? What would be the kind of the minimal threshold to apply? Um, if I can say here, maybe as well to add that, in fact, we should or you should not orientate yourself on your current activities in terms of, okay, can I get funds for my ongoing activities? The issue is to develop a project. Develop a project meaning to achieve something in particular uh, out of what you are doing, where you are the expert. So that's one idea. We are not funding running activities of an organization yeah, or to a very little extent. So that's not the purpose of it. Uh, the second point is, in fact, we, um, we favor uh, transnational projects because what we want to do at European level that we have, in fact, a sharing of best practices, knowledge sharing, in fact, uh, and um, to, 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 get, to get more countries on board that countries, member states, learn from each other what happens there or what is functioning in one area or region might function also in my area or region or city, you know. So transnationality is an element. It's not uh, necessarily, a, 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 let's say, uh, a requirement that all projects must be transnational, but they get extra points. So to the majority of our projects are transnational. That means meaning have, having meaning two or three member states on board, meaning partners from those member states on board. Um, that leads me then to the next um, aspect as well, where in fact we speak about sort of minimum um, grant or the minimum cost. I would roughly say the minimum grant is something like 500,000 euros. And if you have a co-funding rate of 60%, this would say a project should cost or the minimum cost of a project is some 1 million euro. Yeah. So with the average size of, of grants in the life is some 2 million, um, as Claudia said, 1.5, maybe 1.5 to 2 million, roughly like that. So that's the average size. And why do we have, in fact, this is the majority of, of projects applications we get. Yeah. And uh, why this size, why not smaller ones? Because we also comparing the projects when we have, and you have to know that we receive some 800, 900,000 applications and we award some per year, 150 to 200. Yeah. Uh, there we compare, of course, the applications and there the one of the important compar comparison is the impact. Yeah. What do they achieve in terms of nature, biodiversity, climate, or energy efficiency, or uh, let's say uh, or the circular economy and quality of life? What is the impact of the project? And of course, if you have a 50,000 euros project, you cannot compete with any other project which has a much larger extent of, 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 of activities carried out. Yeah? So in that sense, there's no minimum. We will not read any minimum. But in fact, when uh, applying and when being compared with your competitors, then in fact, the projects with higher impact will of course win, will get more points. And the same goes in fact for transnationality that we want to have an added, added European level. It's not on local element, yeah? it's, it's a European program uh, and, and, and it has this, this dimension of, of European added value, which in fact has to, to be considered as well. Claudia, you want to add something? Uh, just um, uh, something about the fact that, as you mentioned, of course, we are looking for um, um, European level projects. So with the transnationality, they will get more points, but it may be uh, it, it, that a single applicant from a single member state has a very good idea that it works huh? and they can apply. But in, in this case, uh, uh, they have to be very careful in checking that uh, uh, the action they propose uh, can be replicated at least. Uh, even if there is no an immediate uh, uh, transnationality and the European level in terms of consortium, 
and actions, it has to be for sure something that can be replicated in other areas of, of Europe. So uh, it can be considered because of course uh, transnationality will give you some, uh, some more points maybe, but uh, also if you have not uh, any transnationality uh, aspect, but you have a very strong replication possibility, this can be also considered. So as, as you see, um, there are many, many possibilities uh, um, to, to adapt to, to your uh, specific uh, uh, need. It doesn't mean that everything can be done, but it's already a quite broader uh, landscape. So we have uncovered now a number of criteria. If I may sum up, there is uh, replicability, uh, or at least the possibility of it. Uh, we have impact, so impact is really crucial uh, in here. And then we also have the European added value. So the transnationality does count uh, quite a bit. I would like to go to another set of questions which concern uh, sustainability. And uh, I will combine two. One is, how do you see a grant as sustainable? Uh, what is a sustainable grant within the few years? And then you can think about, do you require uh, certain activities after the grant period has expired so that it's not just money for that period, but you would expect something from those partners. Another question about sustainability is, um, um, do, can some of the activities be implemented outside of the EU? Because in order to sustain our ecosystems, and so perhaps we need to look also beyond uh, Europe. So there was a question about that, since we also have participants now from around the globe in this uh, webinar, mm -hmm. um, if you could. Yeah. The first thing about the sustainability of the grants. Uh, over the years, also, we learned, of course, how to make a grant, how to make a project sustainable, in fact, uh, in a period where we have no control anymore. As you correctly say, a project is running maybe for four years and what is happening afterwards. So in fact, on the live, we ask also in the project preparation and that, that people can see in the, what, what is expected, in fact, an after life plan. That means already during the life implementation, during the project implementation, beneficiaries have to foresee what they intend to do that the project remains sustainable. Yeah? So they have to have a clear idea, at least to describe a clear idea what to do, how the project is running after the official end of the project. Because exactly what you say was many years, in fact, the problem, because it was difficult to, to develop that. Of course, we cannot control and verify what is happening after 5, 10, 20 years with a project that's out of our, let's say, possibilities. Yeah? But we aim that during the project period, in fact, beneficiaries reflect, develop, and describe already and take actions as well in order to make a project also sustainable. That's also a criteria in the, in the application phase already. What does the beneficiary foresee to remain, to, to bring a project uh, at, a, at a sustainable way that this continues uh, later on? Regarding outside activities outside Europe, uh, in, in, in broad terms, uh, the answer is no, yeah? with some small exceptions, uh, but uh, shall they correct me if I'm wrong? But uh, we are, let's say, orientated, the LIFE program is orientated to the 27 member states. So activities curved which are carried out in the 27 member states. That's different to other programs because uh, for instance, Horizon is broader, yeah? has also other programs inside. Uh, life for the time being is only orientated to the 27 member states with very few exceptions where in fact, uh, if you have a coordinator in EU member states, then a beneficiary, a co-beneficiary, I think, might be also outside Europe. But again, then it must aim, the project must aim of implementing a European objective. Yeah? So the orientation of the project must always be uh, a, a European added value, again, if I can say it in that way. And partners from outside are possible, but of course, they also have to aim, in fact, to, 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 to help and support the development in Europe. That's the philosophy at the time being on the left. And can I add just uh, one element? For sustainability, uh, yes, during the um, application phase, 
the applicant has to uh, explain uh, what they plan to have as an afterlife plan. So they have to clearly stating what they plan to, to do to make the project sustainable uh, also after the end of the period co-financed by the program. Concerning um, eligibility of countries, uh, it's, <laughs> yeah, in general, uh, is, uh, as Christian uh, already explained, uh, we are focusing on um, 27 uh, member states. Uh, third countries uh, may join the program, but they need to ask to join. And um, there are some specific actions that are already um, possible outside Europe. Usually we make the, the example of nature projects. Let's imagine that there is a project that is protecting um, some migra migration species of birds, okay? And they uh, leave, uh, usually in summertime, they leave uh, in Belgium or Netherlands, but they migrate in wintertime in Senegal. Of course, if we want to uh, protect the species, we cannot limit our action to Belgium and Netherlands because uh, it doesn't make any sense if we protect them in Europe and then they risk to die when they are in Senegal. So an action uh, protecting them in Senegal can be uh, accepted, I say it can be. Uh, I cannot say that it will be accepted for sure, but this is one of the very few uh, exceptions that we have already, already had. To continue on that one, um, uh, there was a question about working with different companies. And let's say these companies, um, for example, uh, artificial intelligence, um, uh, information technology, and so on, uh, come from the outside of the EU. Let's say we partner on a project for refugees uh, and uh, digital awareness that would reduce a carbon footprint, but some of the collaborators uh, including funding would come from the uh, outside of the EU, such as Google or Apple, or, or, or uh, what, what is the requirement uh, there? H how does this come together if possible? I, I'm not sure what you mean, including funding. You mean funding of these entities or they come with their own funding? It could be both, but let's say the overall budget does not consist only of contributors coming from the EU. Mm -hmm. If we have again an objective under the life program, obtained if something is orientated on, uh, for something on the life program in theory this is possible yeah? but we we have very rare cases under that very rare cases in fact um, i don't know claudia you know with the better but i don't see this kind of projects coming to coming to the life program yeah? i cannot tell you now why but um, we uh, i'm not aware of something like that um yeah so but in theory again in fact, co-beneficiaries can be outside the member of the EU member states. That was I said. The objective must be again an European ob objective, obtaining something uh, in Europe, uh, in these different areas, and then uh, possibly, I mean, if carbon footprint in Europe is reduced, yeah, uh, then it might be possible. Yeah, this is. But it's a. We don't have that question so often, or not yet. Let's call it like that. Yeah. And this clarifies quite a bit the emphasis of the program itself, uh, as you mentioned before. Yes, this is this is what we want also to convey to you. You know, it's a very let's say Europe orientated uh, program, which again with loud out to see just to make this link loud out to see is much more worldwide. In fact, yeah, it's not only Europe, but the life program is quite uh, orientated to Europe to Europe continental. Yeah. And Claudia, any feedback on your side? Uh... No, I, I think uh, it's, uh, it's correct. Uh, I, I, just, uh, I can just uh, remind that uh, in the application, the applicants have to uh, uh, clarify where they uh, take uh, the rest uh, of the financing. This is for us to be sure that if we co-finance uh, a project, uh, that they have the 
financial capacity also to uh, to manage it and to find because if we co-found uh, uh, 55 percent, uh, but the rest uh, 45 uh, does not show up, uh, of course the project uh, will will not start, uh, and uh, we risk to to lose. Uh, uh, we will uh, recover, but this is not the interest uh, usually. So they have to clearly state where they find the rest of the money they need uh, for, for the budget. It may happen that if I will remember, I, I've had uh, one case in the last poll uh, where one, uh, one project had uh, also uh, a, a financing coming from outside um, EU. So I think it's, uh, it's possible, but uh, okay, it has to be, um, we, we go through a financial viability check uh, of the proposal and the applicant. And when that happens, do you uh, contact the uh, institution directly and they have to provide you additional feedback? Do you call them or how does that interaction happen? The interaction happens with the coordinator. So you have in consortium, you have various, so the, the coordinator must be anyway in the EU member states, you know, and that's our first contact point. So we work with the coordinator. Yeah, I would rather say exclusively. Indeed, we are not allowed to, to discuss uh, with uh, other applicants. We will, let's say, recognize as official counterpart uh, the, the coordinating beneficiary. And we deal directly with the coordinating beneficiary, and it's up to this uh, coordinator to uh, disseminate information or, or to, to collect information to send to the agency and so on. All right, maybe a bit of an unusual question, but could be useful uh, for some of us. Any bad practices that you have seen, things that you have seen repeated, they have come up, but they don't really work, and Maybe they're related to the church or the smallness of an organization or something that you would say, just don't do that. It won't work. Uh, just skip it. Better not use it. Are there any red flags that you would like to share with us? Uh, thank you for this question. It's a, it's a good one as well. Uh, just, just out of my mind, I mean, uh, we have very poorly written uh, applications, of course, yeah, where, in fact, you don't grasp what they want to do. You know, uh, if, if it's not clear for, for a third reader, for somebody else, if it's not clear what they want to do, what they want to achieve in this project, what they, yeah, what, what is, what is the, the topic out of it, that's very often the case that the, the, the application is poorly written. Uh, and then some typical questions or things are also measurement or key performance indicator. You have to reflect what you want to do, in fact, and how you want to achieve something, and you have to be to some sort able to measure something and to, to provide and to prove what you are doing in fact. Eh? Just uh, saying something out of the blue because that's your dream and you want to do that, et cetera, that, that, is not, that is not enough. It should be, it must be concrete. It must be readable and understandable for a third one. And then and, 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 and getting from A to, A to Z, as I said before, uh, with let's say the typical elements of project management. Yeah, I mean, people in the field, they know what project management means and what the project needs to have. So, uh, and this is the standard, let's say, without that, you, you, you should, not, should not apply. Um, what else, I mean, uh, what you should not do, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, we, have, we have a lot of poor applications as well, which in fact just fall through. Uh, some of them repeatedly come then again, but do not improve, that happens as well. No? But uh, yeah, so the, the, I must also say the evaluation um, process as such is very sound. You know, every application is evaluated by two independent external experts before the things, before the applications are reviewed internally by us. Yeah, so we get really an independent ass assessment and these experts don't know from of each other who is doing what, you know. So in fact, this is a quite robust uh, procedure, in fact, which goes through the elements which are needed in order to, in fact, people are telling us what they want to do, and we must be sure that they are going to do it and they have the means in their hand to do it. And also that we know also that afterwards have they done what they promised to do. Yeah? So in fact, it must be, yeah, it must be also a, 
a useful use of taxpayers' money. <laughs> so that, that, of course, is expected from us. Uh, Claudia, do you have any other failure arguments? Uh, <laughs> no, what, what I can add uh, also from my past life, uh, before uh, joining European Commission, uh, I used to work for a consultancy. So I know the two sides of the, of the barrier, let's say. Uh, the first advice I can give uh, is that uh, you have to uh, have a good idea. It has to be clear what you want to do. Uh, this is the, the first thing first. Uh, unfortunately, wherever, not just life, but wherever, when uh, talking about um, European funds, uh, we see clearly that we, we receive uh, uh, proposals that have been sent just to, okay, let's make a try. They try just because they, they want to get the co-financing. I can understand that also in this period that is, is really dramatic from the economic point of view. I can understand that people really need uh, economic help, but this is not the best way to ask. So uh, they have to be very clear with the uh, object of their uh, project. And, they, and I suggest that to read carefully, very carefully, the COFO proposals when we be published and follow the different info days throughout Europe. There will be an, a European info day that will be uh, online uh, immediately after the publication of the call. But then there is a, an important network. You will find that the link uh, in the last page uh, of the slides is the national contact point network. This is very, very important because uh, it is the first contact you may have with life program in your language and they organize uh, session, info sessions. They organize also sometimes some tutorials on how to write the proposal, but you can address them at first to get some important help. So uh, have a clear idea about your project, read carefully documents already available, and ask for additional information and clarification to the national contact point and then we have also a, a functional mailbox in the agency where you can, uh, you can address, but of course you can understand that for a reason of equal treatment, we will not be allowed to go so deep in the answer if you ask uh, what you have to do to have the proposal approved, we sure, can't sure, yeah. go in technical uh, uh, elements, of course. Yeah, there was another question a bit related to this since now we're talking about evaluation or so. How about the external evaluation? There is a consortium called NEEMO, uh, N-E-E-M-O. Could you say a few words about that? People are asking. Yeah, NEMO is not the evaluation. NEMO is our consultancy for monitoring, meaning once projects are selected and have been granted, have been the grant agreements have been signed, there we indeed have a consultancy company called NEMO, and they are monitoring the project implementation. Uh, monitoring does not mean in that sense only supervising that the beneficiary is doing what they promised. It's also very much supporting them in the implementation. So uh, life beneficiaries, once they are in a family, once they are, let's say, accepted as a project, you know, uh, appreciate very much this support from this external consultant because, in fact, they, they give them, in fact, really support in various uh, let's say various periods of the project because the project is running two, three, four, five years, you know, and uh, they get uh, annual visits from these monitors. So this is a very much, let's say, uh, one side a supervision in terms that we know, in fact, what is going on on the ground. Yeah? But it's really very much also meant to be a support for the for the beneficiaries. Yeah. All right, we have now, I think, more and more questions because this is, you know, as we get into it, and well, the interest is, is higher. Uh, and I will yes. just, just share these, uh, these two that came in the chat uh, just most recently. Is there a database 
of those looking for partners for these kind of projects. So I think this is kind of a question. We are an organization or so, and we do not have all that many partners. Is there a suggestion on where to find such uh, partners? Uh, we can offer, uh, first of all, the, the call will be published next week and we just will discuss before this meeting now internally. We will open with the opening of the call next week. We will also open a sort of marketplace only for you, for the outside world, in fact, where beneficiaries or potential beneficiaries can meet others, can, inter can, can, can find interested partners, where you just, in fact, make an announcement that you are looking for partners in area ABC. Yeah? And then uh, other beneficiaries, other potential partners in Europe can join you, can contact you. So this sort of marketplace will be available as well from next week onwards. Yeah. So uh, that's that's the element. And a little bit more again on national, let's say national coordination, if I can say that the NCPs, the national coordination, national contact points, uh, which are available in all member states. They are most of the time in the ministries, but you find them on the live website, NCPs in fact. Uh, there they can be contacted as well and give you valuable in fact the information because they know as well what is going on in one part of the country and what is going on in another part of the country so that's also a possibility so NCPs but also the platform which we will open next week is uh, uh, let's say or provides uh, opportunities to find other partners and the database for projects anyway is available on the, on the left website all right, and I see Claudia nodding, so I, that comes as a strong approval. Um, uh, there, now there's a concrete question about um, how about awareness raising projects? Would this, would this fit and in what sense? Many of us do that in our organizations. We are actually specialized in communicating with the audiences. And so um, does that fit or would it? Yeah. Uh, awareness raising, I, 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 I wish to say, we're not let's say funding awareness raising projects. It must first be related to one of the areas, nature, environment, climate, et cetera. But then indeed in all these areas, uh, energy, um, uh, but also, yeah, yeah, also the clean energy transition, awareness raising is one of the activities which are fundable. Yeah? So awareness raising falls, is like knowledge sharing, uh, best practice, awareness raising, this falls into all the categories, yeah? that uh, yeah, awareness is shared among, among different uh, entities and among different uh, stakeholder groups. Yeah. So the, the answer is clear, yes, but you cannot uh, apply for an awareness raising. You need to connect it with a specific, let's say, operational objective in which area you want to do awareness raising. But maybe that's self-understanding. Correct. Yes. Then you would consider target audiences and so uh, right. to measure yeah. impact and yeah. so on and so forth. Um, in, in the cases you showed, and also towards the end, you talked sometimes about specific target audiences. You mentioned the poor uh, and others. Is there any priority target was the question, or is it general as long as it fits the program? Or would you have any advice on that? Um, if we speak about Poverty, uh, I made a reference to energy poverty because there indeed, this is one element of the intervention area. We are really tackling energy poverty is an aspect. In the other areas, to my understanding, but uh, Claudia, please come in as well. In the other areas, um, tackling social policy or including social policy like poverty here yeah, uh, must be a sort of, let's say, uh, combined effect. Yeah, The first element is always the objectives of the life program. Yeah? So it's always orientated nature, environment, klima, etc. Uh, and then of course, if there's also a social component like, uh, like poverty, uh, let's say mitigated, this is of course a positive element in mitigation, but it's never the core element. Yeah? Except under clean energy transition where we have in really with the citizens engagement, we really have projects really addressing uh, clean energy poverty, so energy poverty aspects, where really the poorer people can, can reduce the energy bill by either renovating their home if there's money, but also can, uh, reducing consumption of water and electricity, et cetera, and to do awareness raising again there from, from a beneficiary and having a targeted group, in fact, where they want to apply that. 
Yeah, I can just add that you you have always remembered that um, the COFO proposal is not completely a standalone uh, uh, action, is linked to policy. So through the COFO proposal and through the projects, uh, we want to implement the policies. So it depends on what are the, the policy objectives. So the target groups are those that are uh, best placed to implement these policies. Uh, I can make an example. Uh, um, if we uh, talk about um, adaptation measures uh, in agriculture, of course, farmers are a, a very important uh, target audience because for instance, uh, I have a project in, uh, I'm managing a project in Finland in um, adaptation uh, and they had some problems at the beginning in convincing farmers that climate change uh, was, uh, was a problem because for them, uh, uh, the season was now much better and for the, they were able just to see the, the, the beauty of the new weather. So as a target group, uh, having this as a target group, the project managed to make them aware that this uh, apparently beauty was uh, bringing uh, together uh, very uh, heavy problems dealing also with the, uh, their budget for instance. So throughout the project, they managed to act on this uh, tar specific target audience and they got very good results. Or sometimes uh, it can be uh, also useful to, to target uh, a specific uh, segment of the audience that is um, more suitable for um, um, uh, replication and to add as a multipliers is the case of young people, for instance, because if you convince or kids uh, in, in the um, school years, because uh, when you work with, uh, with the kids, uh, the primary school, for instance, they go around with parents. So targeting kids uh, means that parents are come together and there is a, a sort of, let's say, multiplier effect. Or if you target uh, um, young people uh, at the university via uh, a specific action uh, in the canteen, they will uh, take uh, some good habits that they will use also at home with parents or, for, or uh, uh, family or friends and, and so on. So you see, it's not completely aside. I think this is great. And uh, this, this webinar has been great. I would really like to thank you all very much for this, because not only now we have gathered so many tips for a better or even successful grant application, but also what we want to do is impact so that what we do as a church institutions and beyond, there is a measurable impact uh, in Europe um, and beyond um, as we try to really to follow closely the the encyclical Laudato Si, and also the inspiration that we got from uh, one another. So on behalf of ELSIA, of the European Laudato Si Alliance, I would first like to thank everybody participating here. We were about 70 from around the globe. Uh, I would like to thank all those who presented questions to our speakers. I think they were very important. They came mostly uh, through chat. I'd like to thank uh, Cinzia in particular, who was very helpful in this process, bringing it all together. Uh, but most of all, of course, our uh, dear uh, guests today, presenters, uh, Mrs. Uh, Claudia Guerini and Mr. Uh, Christian Strasser, I think we have learned a lot from the two of you today. And I much hope that uh, we will be able to meet again. I'm pretty sure that more questions will arise. And should the two of you be available and your colleagues, I think we can um, suggest another webinar, maybe in the fall or so, since urgency is there, climate urgency is there and we need to act. And I think church is uh, well aligned with, uh, with the needs of the creation. So thank you very much again. Thank you all for participating. I wish you all a great rest of the day and great success if applying to these uh, uh, projects through Life Program. All the best and bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 bye.